Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to Musical Talk and happy 2024. It's an utter joy to be sitting here with Thos Ribbits. Hello, Thos. Hello, Nick. It's lovely to see you, Nick. Yes. But does your absolute joy and happy new year depend entirely upon my presence? Because if it does, that means in about an hour's time when we finish recording this episode, despondency will land upon you. Well, you brought me a lovely present here, so your presents so far have been excellent. Um, But no, it's just a a joy to have you in the studio to discuss musicals, talk about musicals, which is what we do on this podcast. I was going to say, if we're not doing that, then I think I may have come into the wrong studio. (laughs) Yes. We are here to just kind of chat about the year, really. Uh, The last one. The last one, and possibly look into the future a bit, something we haven't done in a podcast for a while. Um, I've dug up the programmes of some things that I've seen. I've Why did seen. you bury them? Well, you know, I've got so many <laughs> well, of them. Well, we'll find out when we talk about yeah. some of the shows, possibly. Uh, but good year or bad year, 2023? In terms of musicals? Yes. Hmm. Now, that's a terribly good question. And, of course, it also depends on um, one's perspective, I think. Mm. Because, for me, as you know, my favoured area is fringe and old And if you like fringe and old musicals, I would actually argue that 2023 was a terrific Mm. year. In terms of... Did you ever have a fringe, (laughs) Thos? When I was a boy, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's uh, it's said goodbye a long time ago. It went over the the rainbow with Dorothy. um, And it didn't come back. Yeah, in terms of the fringe, the Edinburgh Festival fringe this year was a great Edinburgh Festival fringe. And as listeners will know, I've recorded more... Um, interviews this last year than I've done for a very long time. So that in itself says Mm. there was a lot of very good promising stuff. Do you think it's recovered now from the post-COVID blues? Oh, indeed, yes. uh, 2022 was the first big one again, as it were. Um, And that felt like it was about 80, 90% of Mm. pre-COVID. I would say last year felt like 95% pre-COVID. But then again, it isn't about size, it's about what you do how it fe- <laughs> and how it feels. Yes. Um, and I thought last year's felt like the full works. Um, it wasn't as big as one or two of the previous ones before COVID, but actually, if as long as that's not a consideration, and it was still pretty enormous. Mm. So I would say that it was, it, was a, it was a cracking year. Actually, 2022 was as well, but 23 particularly good. And in terms of old shows, just randomly, you know, and by, by which I mean stuff that's been around for a long time, 42nd Street, which I'm sure we'll talk about, was on at Sadler's Wells. Going further back, um, I saw an excellent, I really enjoyed it, a version of Ruddy Gore at the Wiltons. I also saw a, a version of the Mikado at the Wiltons, and also at the Wiltons, so praise here for the Wiltons. I'm wilting, of yes, um, well, But um, you know, there was also, um, rather fascinatingly, a version of Sweeney Todd. The, I'm awake um, again. Of... Um, but not the demon Barbara Fleet Street. The play. He is the same character. Yes, the, the musicalised version. It was the original play. Christopher Bond. No, 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 the original play, oh, going okay. back right to the 1830s, okay. 1839, something Grand like that. Grand Guignol. Or... Grand Guignol, exactly. Yeah. And, but melodrama, that was the point. And they did it in the way that the Victorians would have done it. So they added Victorian ballads and Victorian music and Victorian songs. Um and it was an absolutely fascinating experience. the musical. Experience. Well, no, no. no but, I mean, if, you know, if you were expecting Sondheim, you would not yeah. have got Sondheim. If you were expecting music that was sort of appropriate, it was appropriate in feel. It didn't do anything in terms of the dramaturgy or the narrative, as you'd expect from a Victorian play with music. But my goodness, what an experience. So, mm. yes, last year I saw, I saw musicals in speech marks and proper musicals and operetta from the 1830s onwards. So I would say overall 2023 was very good from my perspective, but your tastes are much more commercial, much more spectacle-based. Mm. What do you make of 2023 looking back? A difficult year, I think. There were many times when I was sitting just thinking, there's just nothing really that's grabbing my mind. And maybe it's because I'm getting older. You're looking I'm, for a mind grabber, were you? Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting older, so I'm not much interested in the, the kind of youth shows of today 
I've kind of seen everything that I, I enjoy, but I, I do in, saw a couple of, of shows and we have thoughts on them, but a lot of revivals. Yes, of course. A lot of one-off concerts that don't interest me at all because I like to see proper theatre in all its mm. forms, not just people standing at yeah. microphones singing. Um, so someone sitting at a microphone talking. But mercifully not singing. Yes. Yeah. But there were a couple of, of, of highlights, which I'm sure will um, we'll go back and forth. Tell us, start with you, Thos. What, what oh, springs to mind immediately? I'm going to start with a show, and I don't know if you saw it, but it's uh, it's got a Disney connection, and that's mm. Newsies. I did see Newsies, yes. Right, well, that maybe is a ripe for discussion kind of opener then. Mm. The thing about this is, and it was interesting to me, Newsies was what I would call a show that needed a very particular venue because it was so built into the venue in which it was performed, which is the Troubadour, um, which is the brand new sort of warehouse style theatre um, in Wembley, Wembley mm-hmm. Park, and is grand for its purpose. And it's where Starlight Express is going to go later this year with, uh, and there's a certain amount of excitement buzzing yeah. up about that. I got my ticket. Oh, well, well done. It's a great venue. And I think it was the first time I'd been there. Uh, and I went to see Newsies twice in the end with different people sitting in slightly different places. It's an interesting show. I didn't know the film. I didn't really know Newsies except that I remembered that it had been a hit as far as I remembered on Broadway a few years ago. But a terrible flop of a film. Yes, the film was never a great yeah. success, was it? And yet the fil- uh, the stage version that we saw has developed the film some way. There's new songs in it yeah. or a number of new songs yeah. in it. It has a fascinating history in the fact that the, sh- the film, was it? It, was, uh, it was it was, years, it was when 1990-something, yeah. it was when Disney were churning them out and... Um, it got Alan Menken and, and Jack Feldman in to do this musical based on the true story of the newspaper um, delivery News, chap. The news strike. voice strike. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it was a massive flop. The, there's a song in it called Hard Times. Hard Times that won Razzie of the Year. The same year that Alan Menken won the best song yeah. of the world for Beauty and the Beast or something. and um, I mean, we should make a point about the Razzies. There's, mm. a, there's an element of tongue-in-cheek with those yeah. things. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no suggestion that it's... Yeah, but there's no suggestion that's the worst song ever no. written by uh, any means. No. It's yeah, it just break. wasn't successful within the context in which but it was But the film had a massive cult following. Mm. And that's easy for you to say. suddenly all these... Um, university and high school students started, loved it as young people. who started putting on their own unofficial productions there's nothing disney does better than to look at something and decide how to make money out of it so they thought hang on let's revise this as a proper musical yes. there's clearly a demand yes. to sell to schools and, and new theater groups and things like that Gosh, not with the choreography I saw at the, at the Troubadour, but yes, Let's I see the concept. Tr- so they did, they did that. They tried it out um, not on Broadway. It was a huge success. It went somewhere else. It was a huge success. Seattle, I think, or somewhere. Then it went to Broadway. Many Tony Awards later, it's now this huge, massive yeah. musical, which is a wonderful... It's a beer moth in yeah, terms of that. There's something slightly ironic about Disney... So, and sorry to interrupt you mm. there, but, but you're right. But um, there is an irony, and yeah. I know that you think the same way, of a company like Disney, which is successful in a very capitalistic kind of way. You know, it's a, a commercially successful company mm. pushing a commercially um, uh, successful, successful show, show yeah. which is ironically about industrial action, which seems a little bit uh, yeah. against the capitalist and degree, so more about exploitation. Money doesn't matter. It's all about family and all that kind but of stuff. But there's an interesting question here, because I have heard this issue debated. And here's a question, you know, and I'll ask this in the episode of Newsies, which I should be broadcasting later uh, on mus- Musical Talk. With, I went to see it with my friend Josh the second mm. time, and he and I spoke about it. So I asked him this very question. I'll ask you too. Who wins in Newsies? The people who want the newspapers win. Well, customers, all right. Yes. Yeah. Um... You know, it's set up as an argument between the newsboys and the press barons, essentially. Mm. One in particular, but he seems to represent all the papers. Who is the winner? I was. I, it's been a while since I've seen it. I, I saw it last summer. Um, he actually says, "I can't go back on the pay." Yeah, reduction. I think they. Ju- I, I think they just want what they were doing, but they yeah. don't get that. So they, they do. They, the The reduction, the the increase in the cost of the newspapers to the newspaper boys mm. ret- is retained at the end. It's an interesting thing. I'll tell you what. I, I'll tell you my take on it because I. It's the very fact you're having. We're having this discussion and it's not quite as clear-cut when you think about it. Mm. At the end of the day, 
the newspaper barons say that we can't reverse. And so the boys go, all right, but what we want is buyback. So they get an, they get an extra thing. So they've, they've got the more expensive newspaper, so they do have to shift more. But because they've now got an incentive on buyback on what they don't shift, they are prepared to go back to work. So is that better terms and conditions or not? It's not clear. No. But it's not. They don't win the battle they go into the strike for. The newspaper barons ultimately do. They have to pay a bit more by the, pay, the payback thing. But it's also suggested that that is actually going to allow paper boys to risk taking more newspapers to sell mm. because they can enhance their profits. So actually, it's a win-win for the press baron and his cohort. For the newspaper boys... I'm using boys here. I know there were women here, but we'll talk about the uh, the issues of gender a minute, in a minute in newses. What they go into the strike for, they do not get. What they get is something else that they wanted, but that wasn't what they went into the strike for. So they do go back to work. They get something, but they don't get what they actually go in for. So it's a show where you feel when you come out that the news boys have won, but it's a show that if you think... It's where mm. the press barons win. It's an interesting sleight of yeah. hand news. Is. And also because it's so technically impressive, you don't really care about it. I mean, I, 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 you, you leave having enjoyed the songs and the dancing. You're not really oh, well, on the surface. Oh, they won. This is the first time I've ever really sat there and thought about the politics and thought of it. about it, yeah. Well, in fairness, it is very hard to get excited about over-century-old politics. Mm. And it's very hard to get, particularly in another country as it is for us, um... Funnily enough, the real story is oddly more interesting than news is. You know, uh, um, there is a character who, in the real story who's, he's, he's a, I think he's an 11-year-old boy who's got one eye. Yeah. Um, and he he's not in the piece at all, but he's... Um, Maybe he's the one with the broken leg that they kind of replaced. Uh, no, 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 no. He's, he's not crutchy. He's not the sympathy okay. character. He's actually the leader. He's, he's the one that Jack replaces. Okay. Um, Jack becomes the leader in this. Um, I, 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 the story of the the, the one eyed boy is amazing, and I, I can't recite it here. But it's uh, there's like a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's really fascinating. I mentioned just a minute ago. We've got to touch on this. What did you make of the news boys stroke news girls issue and the way it was presented in the piece? I didn't see it as an issue at all. Because interestingly, we call it news boys here. The film was called Newsboys, wasn't it? In England, yeah. but the film on America is called Newsies. Yeah, because it's not a term. We, we don't yeah. use the word Newsie yeah. yeah. So I think it's an issue that we've made for ourselves in this country by having the term Newsboys. Oh, I see. If I'm, that's what you... Well, I I'm, I'm wasn't really thinking that. I was thinking of the fact that the programme is at great pains <laughs> to say um, there were news girls as well. Mm. So there were news boys and then news girls. Obviously more boys and girls. And we don't really see any news girls until the Bowery Boys speech marks turn up. You know, if you remember rightly, New York is divided up into these zones of newspaper... Districts. Yeah, if you like, that's exactly right. And the one they're all frightened to go and visit, I think, is the Bowery, um, if that's right. And uh, we don't see them until later on. Mm. And then they sort of speech marks come to the rescue. Or is it Br Brooklyn's here? That... Maybe, or maybe it's Brooklyn. Yeah. But whatever it is, it brings a certain amount of heft to the mm. um, industrial... Uh, um, argument on behalf of the news uh, newsies community and in the london production they're all women so they are the female cast mm. now as news girls let's call them that for the purposes of this point so up to that point all the newsies in all the other part of new york were boys and then suddenly when brooklyn turns up they're all girls which makes it sound like the whole city was segregated upon gender lines. Now, obviously, that's nonsense. You pay no attention to it. And it, but what it really is, of course, is a way of making sure there are there's enough women's roles in the piece because that is its weakness, in my view. I really enjoyed news. It's much mm. more than I had any right to. The plot is wafer thin. You know, the resolution. It's like a newspaper. Well, ha, ha, that's a very good point. But you know, the resolution is inspired by the fact that Jack is kept overnight in the press baron's factory. Well, it and happens they lock, to be a machine. They, they lock him up in a room yeah. with the press. Did that happen? I have no idea. I don't yeah. think so. I'd be done, uh, jolly well surprised if that did happen. But, you know, it's all right. It's a, it's a conceit for the yeah. theatre. The, the plot is wafer thin in that sense. So I enjoyed it terribly. But it does look like it's trying to patch mm. up the gender issues. And the, when you look at the women roles in it, you've got the female reporter, who turns out to be the daughter of the, uh, the press baron. Fine. Very well done. Uh, by Bronte Barbe, I think, was the actress, mm -hmm. the actor that we saw. And she was great. Um 
And then there's the, the woman who runs the Vaudeville Theatre, uh, who is also terrifically good and is a kind of maternal figure to the boys. That is more or less it. There's a, there's a, there's a secretary character. And then in order to dress that balance, they then have to make the, all the newspaper boys from Bowery or from Brooklyn into women. Yeah. And that's fine. I accept what they're doing. It's a bit heavy handed. They would have been in my. So I tell you what I would have preferred. I would have preferred boys and girls. I would have preferved boys in, and girls in all the zones. Yeah. And that, that, you, you just wouldn't have thought about it then. It's when they all suddenly turn up and they're and they are women mm. or girls. You suddenly think, hang on, why are they all suddenly, you know, up to that point, point, it's actually not much of an issue. Mm. Um in terms of, except in terms of representation. But the original production on Broadway, which you can watch on mm. Disney Plus, I don't know if you have it, but um, I don't, no. it's, they don't do that. What do they do? It's just, I think it's um, boys throughout. Oh, right, okay. That's so interesting. That, but I can see why they want to change that. I mean, yeah. I, I, I have no problem with their being girls. In fact, I think it's a good idea. Mm. I just wish they'd integrated it better. Yeah. We've been a bit odd about it, or negative about this show, and I don't mean it to be negative, because as I say, I saw it twice and I really liked it, mm. even though I think the plot is way for thin and ridiculous in many ways. What is great about it? The dance. Yeah. And that's odd for me, because I'm not really a dance person. The um, the power of the performances, you know, it, it's pace is unrelenting. The performance in terms of the dancing was second to none, some of the best I've ever seen. It was exhilarating for an audience. Um, seeing a show with such a scope in the troubadour was a real experience. Mm. You know, and, you know, there are moments when the um, the newspaper boys and girls in their groups walk up and down the aisles and on um, gangways above you and yeah. below you. You know, it's a... Although it's a big stage, it's quite difficult sometimes for shows in arena-style venues to feel intimate. But oddly, this one manages that. And mm. somehow it brings you in, in a space you feel that's going to be very difficult to bring one into. I suspect we'll see more of that in Starlight Express. So I thought Newsies was great. Yeah. Not the best thing I've ever seen by any means, I, but I really liked it. I, I loved it. It didn't hit with the same impact as the Broadway production. I think the I had very... I had issues with not only what I was hearing when it came to the orchestrations, but also the sound itself is is notoriously bad in that venue because it's not because it's not a theatre. It's not a theatre. But can I just say, on the two nights I went, mm. I didn't hear every word, but I know what you mean. They made some odd musical choices, like with some. some it was some, all done on the Celeste. The original Broadway version has at times a harmonica, which is kind of Jack's oh. sound, and that wasn't in that production. Can I just ask, do you think that's a cultural thing? Because in this country, the harmonica is associated either with the Wild West yeah, or but, but World he's War singing, But he's singing about going to Santa Fe in New Mexico, isn't he? So that's where... Does anyone in Britain know where that is? Th it enough. shouldn't matter. You it know, probably awful. It, no, it, you're right. It's just an odd omission that make a good point, yeah. was um, there. But it, it was... A, I thought the lighting was excellent. Yeah. You know, some very powerful visual Bulbs. elements. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm glad it's finally come to London. It, uh, the first production in the UK was at Arts Ed. Was it interesting? Which had Jack Yarrow in it yeah. before going on to Joseph and Amazing Technicolor Doodah. That still remains the best production I've seen. That's interesting. Out of two of them. Yes. But that's not to say you don't like the Troubadour one. I, I, I enjoyed the Troubadour one. It was nice to have it here. I went with my friend Rosie, who was incredibly excited by it, and she adored it. Yeah, so that was... That's that, Newsies. Happy Newsies year. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm very excited to, to see... Not so much to hear, but to see Starlight Express. Well, um, it's an unknown commodity to me, um, but it's Andrew Lloyd Webber. And so I, this, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to use this as a segue into the, a second show to talk about, you. which I saw. I've got this wrong impression of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Now, I think of Andrew Lloyd Webber as being representative of the big, blown London shows. And by blown, I mean blown as in overblown. The mega musical. Yes, but sometimes they're, they're too big for their own good and you can lose the story within it. And I'm sorry to say it, I do not like Phantom of the Opera. I know it's treason. I know it's uh, insolent to say so, but I don't like it. I, for the music or the direction or both? To be honest, there's not much about it I do like it. To me, it's pushing in too many different directions. So I've some, as I've said before, sometimes it feels like there's a really good Gilbert and Sullivan trying to get out. Sometimes there's a really good comedy trying to get out. It's terribly melodramatic and po-faced mm. in places, and yet at other times the comedy falls flat when it's trying to be comic. So I, I don't like it. I do like Evita, it turns out. You see, but here's, here's my thing. If you, take, if you take Phantom of the Opera out of the picture for me... It turns out that I like most of Andrew Lloyd Webber's shows. I like Stephen Ward. I know. And once again, treason. I like Stephen Ward. I like Evita. Obviously, I like Evita because everyone likes Evita and it's terribly good. But I had this idea in my head 
that Andrew Lloyd Webber is overblown, lush and sentimental. And then, of course, it turns out that actually he's a master songwriter and the things are all brilliant. I went to see Sunset Boulevard. I went again with my friend Josh Clark, who's a presenter on Musical Talk. He took me, because I would never in a million of years have said I shall go and see Sunset Boulevard by um, Andrew Lloyd Webber. I should say the film is magnificent. Mm -hmm. It's always been a part of the repertory of films that my family have watched over the years. It came to London with Nicole Scherzinger in the, the, the main role. Mm -hmm the Gloria Swanson role, as I see it, and I wouldn't have gone to see it. But my friend Josh said, we must see this, desperate to see it, let's go and see it. We went to see it. We had seats in the second row from the very back in the gods. We could not have been further away. We could. There was could one be, row we could, could have been further could have been away. Could in the back row. Yeah, or possibly outside the fire exit. Yeah. That's right. But do you know what? It was electrifyingly brilliant. On a number of fronts, and we'll talk about performance in the end. Did you see it? No. Fine, I'll just talk as I, I found it then. Let's talk about the score, because that's what I used to get in. It's Andrew Lloyd Webber. Andrew Lloyd Webber is being versatile. He's being emotional and sentimental when he needs to be, but he's also playing against that. Mm. You know, it's, it's it's the full theatrical experience. The songs are, he, you know, he's got, he's, a, he's got a good mind for melody when he wants to pick a melody. There are some really nice ideas in a song, and I'm sure that we'll talk about the idea of a song having ideas, particularly in terms of lyrics. It's not enough to just write a song saying this is going to happen and this is happening. Even if it's carrying the plot, it's got to have an idea in it. And all the songs have got an idea. There's a wonderful one called Let's Have Lunch quite early on. I don't know if you know it. But, um, you know, on stage it was a fabulous conceit of people in a row who were just sort of giving him insincere greetings and let's have lunch before disappearing, you know, knowing for well none of this is ever going to happen. It's all about insincerity and the, the tinsel of Tinseltown, let's be honest, it's all about Hollywood. The score was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I was stunned by how much I enjoyed it. And then I had a casual conversation with my father about it mm. a little later. And he said, oh, it's one of my favourite um, Andrew Lloyd Webber scores. And he only knows it from the recording because he's not seen it. Although we all know the film terribly well. So I was very, very impressed by Sunset Boulevard. And then on top of it, there were the performances and the direction. So they both need a bit of mentioning, and I won't go on too long. But there is a danger sometimes when uh, someone who's famous, like Nicole Scherzinger, um, is cast in a show. You can think, oh, stunt casting. That person was famous 20 years ago. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> she was in a pop group, and that, you know, it's terrible. Sometimes you think, oh, that person's a pop singer. They're not mm. necessarily an actor. She was excellent in Cats. Yeah, and it turns out that she is an excellent actress who can also be a pop singer. I admired her very much. So, you know, as an actor, uh, she's got all the acting chops you need and she carries that difficult role brilliantly. And you see the damage. Mm. You see the passion. You see the increased cracking all the way through. And there are, you know, she's... Is that Jamie Lloyd's directing, though, or is it...? Well, obviously some of it's the directing, because actually also the directing is pinpoint sharp. But her performance, you know, there was no doubt within minutes that it wasn't stunt casting. It was very clear that she had been picked but, for her acting skills. She can sing as well, obviously, brilliantly, but... Sorry, just to... Yes, the concept of the show is rather wild, isn't it? Well, it sort of is, but do you know, it, um, it's... Bearing in mind, thematically, it's about... The theatricality, shall we say, of the silent melodrama films being phased out in terms of modern, by which I mean 1950s, golden Hollywood, and people being left behind, the whole theatrical experience um, is enhanced by a cinematic experience because there are live cameras on the stage catching moments as you would in black and white on occasions. And so you are seeing projections of actors really close up on stage, which you might not normally see in detail if you're sitting in the second row from the back in the gods, on the screen. And of course, what that also says is this is, but and it's a silver screen, it's in black and white. And so you are seeing those emotions, often from the Norma Desmond character of a Nicole Scherzinger role, in close-up, mm. on a screen, in black and white, as though you were watching her melodramatic films it, from the silent era. Is is the design outside of the black and white stuff, dare I say, glorious technicolour, so you get the two polarities between... No, it's actually a monochromatic piece. Okay. It's mostly black and white, and indeed the film was in black and white. So you're right, the technicolour was absolutely the rage by 1950, mm. but not all films were made in it. Um, I would like to have seen it done with, with colour 
blazing colour versus black and white footage of that colour because that would give, that a would kind give of, you a contrast. Yeah. I'll tell you why I don't like that because I think the film is originally um, a film noir. Mm. You know, it's like, would you make a colour version of the Maltese Falcon? I wouldn't. I don't think you'd get the atmosphere. Um, and it's the same with this. I think making it monochromatic works brilliantly. But the thing that really struck me, and I'll stop in a minute on this, but the thing that struck me most about the whole concept is this the the push me pull you elements of it uh as i say the theater against the cinema merged into one and i've you know we've all seen projections in cinema brief and, encounter famously yeah yeah. It's, um, yeah yeah indeed and lots of others you know we've used them for scenery i mean the woman in white used them mm. for a long time and you know it was the biggest one to bring them in they're in every show now. Yeah, and, uh, and no one bats an eye. But they're not projections here. They are well, they, they are being used for narrative purposes, not design purposes. And the theatrical elements, so the stage element, is actually like, you know, you don't go to, to the Savoy in London, one of the glorious Art Deco theatres, and expect to see what is equivalent of a black box piece. You know, mm. it's got almost a fringe sensibility. There's almost no scenery per se. What there is is this big screen that comes up and down when you need it. The screen, the, the stage is more or less blank. Few props, there's a few chairs at the back which are needed, but what you're not getting. If that screen wasn't there, you'd be getting pretty much a blank stage. That is very theatrical, and we understand it in the terms of theatre. With all the trappings of cinema and cinematography also being utilised to tell the story. And to tell the story, oddly, the hybrid makes it better. You know, it's sometimes you can mix those two things together like oil and water and they don't mix. But in this occasion, everything came out marvellously. Um, there are so many lovely bits and pieces. And it, there's even a, a, an in-joke, the, briefly at the beginning of Act 2, where there's a stunning... One of the actors sings. They start in their dressing room. They go all mm. round the back stairs. They come out into the street. They walk through to the front of the street, down the Strand, into the Savoy, and then come onto the stage that way while singing with members of the public watching and filming them on their cameras. And as you pass, there's a cardboard cutout of Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> uh, and so there's a lovely bit of playfulness in it as well. So yeah. it's it's a show that has really knocked my socks off in a way that before I went in, I thought, oh, it's going to be overblown, mm. lush and sentimental. All the things I don't like about Andrew Lloyd Webber, and it turns out that all the things I don't like about Andrew Lloyd Webber are not things that Andrew Lloyd Webber particularly does. I've got a wrong... I've had for many years the wrong opinion of Andrew mm. Lloyd Webber, and I keep getting the evidence that I'm wrong, and it's going to eventually stick. Surely that's the direction, though. It's not just the direction. I agree direction can be good or bad and enhance or diminish a piece, but you cannot... Make because, something which is badly written. Because ha, how would you have felt had you saw the original Sunset Boulevard with the massive sets and the house? And the, would you have but felt I the know. same? I, I genuinely don't know because I didn't see it. So I, I, I've got no way of being able to say what I would have felt or mm. responded to or thought. But the very fact that you can make it into something shows there's something there. What, you know, it's, there's a horrible phrase about not being able to polish excrement. You can't make something out of nothing but you can make something better out of yeah. something. So I'm not saying for one second that Sunset Boulevard is his masterpiece in terms of the score, but in terms of how that score works with the narrative, it must be a contender. Mm. It's very good. And it's just announced it's off to Broadway. So that's, oh, has it? That's, well, I mean, no way surprised. But, no. I do want to talk about Old Friends, which do so. I saw, which is still playing. Stephen um, Sondheim. Yes. Did you get to see it yet? I did not. No. Is that through choice or just not on your... Oh, now that's a really good question as well. You're asking lots of good questions. Let me tell you, my relationship with Sondheim is... I love Stephen Sondheim, but I'm not blind to his flaws. Mm. And the truth is, I genuinely think he stopped being the genius after Assassins. I think Assassins is his last great show. I, once again, I speak treason, but I don't like passion. It's, uh, you know, passion is pretending to be about genuine passion. Mm. It fails on every level. As far as I'm concerned, I simply don't buy that story and I simply don't buy the emotion I see when I see it performed. And I've seen it performed brilliantly. It is not through failure of performance. I'm speaking much less treason when I say I don't think Roadshow is all that. And very few people, I think, would stand up and say, no, no, it's marvellous, uh, including great Sondheim aficionados, which is not to say it's terrible, but it's not a brilliant show. It's certainly not classic era golden Sondheim. Sondheim. We're all waiting for Here We Are to come to London and we'll make a judgment on that when, when it does. So for me, Sondheim is brilliant up to mm. and including Assassins and then stops. I like Sondheim, however. I am less keen on listening, I've discovered over the years, because funny enough, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've had more Sondheim concert shows, let's call them that. Mm. You know, let's celebrate his 80th, let's celebrate his 90th. 
let's celebrate his death as it oddly is old friends um or commemorize anyway but lots and lots and lots of concerts and there's only so many concerts of sometime songs that mm. i can bear and to be honest after 1974's a sometime evening 1973 something like that you know the lp that everyone had for years and years and years which i think is still brilliant and then marry me a little um and um side by side yeah the, you know, the, the great anthology shows some jukebox musical versions love them all but i've had too many sondheim concerts yeah. and i don't particularly want to see another sondheim concert the, the, this is less so a sondheim concert it's more mini productions in I mean, si- vignettes and scenes. yeah inside a sondheim concert if that makes sense so there's costumes and there's yeah scenery and the projections are quite nice um for what purpose i don't know i think no. it's just to give something a bit different other than just just a concert just yeah. a concert and the, the band are excellent it was amazing seeing bernadette peters even though she's a desired taste um but no one could den- deny that she's no, a name ab- and, ab- and, absolutely. and a great song time interpreter yeah legend know. and yes. uh leah salonga was excellent oh, and yes. her mrs lovett was something i would like to see a full production of as would so many my father went and he's not a huge knowledge base when it comes to musicals i'm not sure why he went but he did and he absolutely hated it which but kind what of reasons did he give he said it was like being shouted at for three hours and does he mean in terms of the performance or does he mean that the message is coming through from the script he doesn't listen to lyrics so, Fine, so it just it was purely the, the music but it's he li- feel. but he likes sending the clowns because he knows it he likes some of the jazzy stuff as well um but i think it as we as andrew and i said in our review and we saw it yep. yeah if you don't know sondheim this is not the best thing to see don't start with this yeah, if you do know Sondheim, it is probably the best thing to see. But then again, do we want to hear, I'm still here, sending the clowns, a little priest, blah, 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 again? Quite. No matter how well they're sung or played. I mean, are we running everybody on, ought to have a maid. I've yeah. seen so many times now, it now irritates Yeah, me. are we now running purely on sentimentality for yeah. Sondheim himself? Well, I can answer that. Yes. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I didn't see Old Friends, but the BBC showed over Christmas a televised version of a previous Sondheim. This is last yes. cr- Christmas before the one we just had. Uh, no, they showed it again no, this okay. last year because yeah. I, I saw it very okay. recently. Fair enough. I hadn't seen it the first couple of times because right. I was fed up with Sondheim concerts. But I, I taped this one, as it, to use the old-fashioned phrase. I yeah. recorded it off the television and I watched it over the Christmas period. <laughs> and I quite enjoyed it. But the reason I quite enjoyed it, and I was trying to work out why I quite enjoyed it, and it's because most of the cast, not all, but most of the cast were British. Now, Mm. it's not a simple bit of chauvinism. It's not just, oh, look, they're British actors, I prefer this. It is because because it was a concert and therefore denarratived, and there were British performers. The British performers were singing it as British performers, not as British performers pretending pretending to be American characters. Mm. So they were stripped of the context which is a good or a bad thing, you know, bearing in mind that Sondheim is the great integrated musical writer and therefore not all his songs survive well, outside yeah. of the context of the piece they're in. But it was really interesting to hear those songs sung by British actors with British accents, with British sensibilities. One that sticks out immediately for me is the version of um, It's the Little Things You Do Together from Company, which in this concert was sung by the late Hayden Gwynn, mm. so it was very nice seeing her again, of course, and Rob Brydon who's obviously Welsh. And so there's his Welsh singing. He sings very nicely. And Hayden Gwynn knows her, knows how to perform. She's yeah. a great singer and a great performer. So they sing this song as though they are a British couple. It's also played up for much more laughs, interestingly, which I think partly when you're removed from the context of a piece, you've got to make the songs. We were talking earlier about the idea of a song. You have to make that idea live outside of the show that it's in. And therefore, I think that what they were having to do is find what is the hook that we can make this work on. I think anyone watching it would understand immediately it's about a married couple discovering that married life isn't necessarily ideal. But the whole of company was songs out of context anyway, really, wasn't it? It is, but there is a, there's, a, there's a golden thread through. Yeah. If you're just watching one song, I think an audience will understand immediately what it's about. But you still need, to, you need a hook to make it more than just being what the words are. And they, they, they played up the comedy. You know, for example, Rob Brydon was put on a... He's a very short man, and they put him in a very tall chair. Mm. And there's a moment where Hayden Gwynn, who's a very tall woman, has to help him on the chair, which is actually an interesting comic moment, and you could hear the audience enjoying it, because it's a live performance. But also, 
represents what the song is about, actually. But, you know, the, the differences which make a relationship work, as in that case, a very tall woman helping a small man onto a chair, is also the things that really highlight the differences between them, which also rub them up the wrong way. So it was, it, the comedy was for a purpose. So I was actually quite surprised by how enjoyable all that was. Uh, we've strayed quite a long way from old friends, mm. but I enjoyed that. One often does. <laughs> but I enjoyed that Sondheim concert because it gave one a chance. But it, it's, the same, it's the same it, title, isn't it? That they, it? It is old friends and this is what the TV show turned into when they um, put it I'm up. not sure I'd pick that up, yeah. but that's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, but let's put it this way. I... You were saying, do we really want to hear the old Sondheim songs again and again? Well, actually, the answer is if you can make them live slightly mm. differently, then yes, they can support another a recording. Again, it's like your Sunset Boulevard thing. If you yeah. do things differently, it does add great. new levels yeah. to it and make you appreciate the, the work in You're different just looking ways. at it from a slightly different angle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's old friends. Which, I, you know, I, I did enjoy it, but I know sometimes, so it kind of um, worked for me, but not so much other members of my family, let's just yeah. say. But did Andrew enjoy it? Yes, he did. Um, he was very. He liked the theatricality of it. The fact they were doing little scenes with costumes. Yes. Yeah. Another new show I saw this year, which was always exciting, is the Time Traveler's Wife, which is at the Apollo Theatre. Based on the novel. Based on the novel, and then the film, and the TV series, and inev inevitably, <clears throat> excuse me, a musical. Wonderful concept, and I was just a bit sad it wasn't executed as well as it could have been when it came to the writing, but this has long been a, a thing I have about the art of songwriting and lyric writing and things like that. So may I ask, I didn't see it, so may I ask you a couple of questions? Let's mm. break the difference down between the, the narrative either the story that carries it along, which presumably must have worked on stage or should have worked on stage because obviously it's been done so many times in different formats and has worked as a book, play, mm. television programme, exactly as you say. And then there's the score and then there's performances. So yeah. if we look at it from those three different vantage points, what did you make of those? I Let's thought, start with the narrative. I thought the story is such a clever idea and a dream for any musical theatre yeah. writer to get his or her chops around um, the concept of this... Yeah couple who the husband zips around to different moments in time and we see him in different eras meeting his wife for the first time and it's a bit like merrily we roll along when you just have different um and well, it's a non-linear narrative in that sense it, it's linear for, it's non-linear for him but it's linear for her but so what about us as the audience we are seeing it from her point of view so we are traveling through time chronologically but he pops in yeah. at different points yeah yeah so um but okay. then we see the time the era in which he's in with yeah. the wife a bit younger or a bit older. So, it, it, so you it, see it from both sides? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that is interesting. Right, okay. So you won't necessarily appreciate this, but there's also a Doctor Who avatar here, mm. which is uh, the Doctor and River Song, who meet each other in the wrong order. Yeah, and it's been 45 minutes and you mentioned Doctor Who. And, and, and Gilbert I'm and Sullivan. I'm waiting for Radigal. Yeah. I haven't mentioned Radigal yet, and it was you a show I saw You mentioned last it earlier. So. Um, no, I mentioned Gilbert and Sullivan. I haven't okay. mentioned Radigal. Um, so you get that wonderful, very clever concept of you know the the poor wife being mm. you know seeing it from her point of view and the husband now emotionally it's, renting that must be yes, it's right. never explained why no no but but it's you know <laughs> post the sums it up really well, he's it's, wearing nice boots it it's just a shame that again we have pop song writers doing it all right let's get on to the score then so you're saying the narrative holds up on stage yeah good so that's good but your quibble, I think, certainly the way I'm reading it, mm. is the score, and in particular, I think, pop lyrics. Yeah. And, and not so much... Can we talk about what we mean by pop lyrics here? Pop I lyrics know we've got, and are... We've discussed it before. Cole Porter would never rhyme hat with cats, no. for example. Whereas pop songwriter... Or hat with cat. Yeah. Um, it's more based on assonance mm. than perfect rhyming. And I always go back to something you said, Thos... If you're going to rhyme, do it properly. I agree with that. And I think the man who said that is wise, in my view. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to Sondheim, he would never rhyme door with storm. Yeah. Oh, you know? yes. And it's just sadly a problem slash thing, mostly problem, that's <laughs> occurring a lot nowadays because we producers seem to think you have to have Grammy Award winning songwriters writing musicals, as in writing the songs mm. for these musicals. And, you know, I, I was attacked on Twitter for saying this and said, oh, it doesn't really matter and things. Well, in my mind, it does. Because, for many of us, it does. Yeah. Because yeah, it's craft. Yes, and it's a dying craft. Um, 
So you get... And it removes the satisfaction from a song if you, the audience, and not all, not everyone does, but if you are the kind of person, and there's still a lot of us about who hear the Miss Rhymes... And you go, it, well, it, yeah, first of all, you wince, exactly. And secondly, it takes you out of the piece. Mm. It, it fails in its principal requirement, which is to be seamless and unclunky. You know, a song is there to enhance the plot, it's not to take you out of it. And yes, we've all... You know, in certain contexts, a pop lyric is absolutely satisfactory. But let's go back to that point I was making about an idea in a song. If you go back to almost any Gershwin song, any Cole Porter song, just to use that classic era, but it's true of Rodgers and Hammerstein anyway, each song isn't just about what the characters are doing. It's not just about what the characters feel. I know later on we get integrated musicals. We were talking about some time a minute ago and how those songs are built in. But each song still got an idea behind it. Same with Gershwin, same with Cole Porter. Um, you know, let's talk about it's the little things you do together. There's a very clear idea about this. We've discussed it already, mm. which is in one song of three minutes, say, the ups and downs of a relationship are explored uh, with comic rhyming triplets. Um, you know, it's made a, it's a comic song, but at the same time, it tells you about the antagonisms in a relationship and coming out of that relationship in other directions. That's the idea. If you're writing a song which is just a pop song, Pop songs don't always have what I would call the musical theatre idea behind them. They are telling you what needs to be done in terms of the plot sometimes, or sometimes they're just an emotional response. But they they seem like I have seen enough shows where the pop lyric just is being used for narrative purposes, but is not being used to finesse anything in the narrative, which could be an emotion or it could be a point or an idea. I keep coming back to this, a good lyric, you know, I'm sure you'll agree with me, music is emotional, but the lyric is normally or can often be, and certainly has a requirement to be in many shows, the intellectual hook on point. And it is that marriage between the intellect of a, a lyric and the emotion of a piece of music. Now, obviously, this isn't true in all cases, but in many cases, that makes a piece successful mm. or a song successful. Um, and I find pop lyrics, because of the lack of craft in the lyrics, can often fail in the principal ambition of being more than just prose with music. But sorry, I've taken over your point. I That's all right. <laughs> and I You've didn't see the show. Summed it better than I have. Um, I, I absolutely agree with all that. And it's very prevalent in this because you have this incredibly emotional story that spans, you know, 50 years and the worst thing ever yeah. happened to a relationship, you know, your partner leaving for 10 years and coming back. But yes. and. Or best thing, you know, it depends what your situation is. But <laughs> Well, coming back might not be so much fun then. But yeah. it's, it's such a shame that, you know, Joss Stone, a very good soul singer, great singer, shouldn't write musicals. Is it they shouldn't write musicals or should they spend more time on getting the lyrics a little bit more finessed? Because presumably, did you like the, 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 the harmonies, the, the, um, the melodies rather? The thing is with musicals is you never really know, and it's the same with Lloyd Webber, who has done all the the Lyric. grunt the grunt work. <laughs> who has come up with the interesting harmonies? Is it Joss Stone sitting at a piano, slavering, slaving away, trying to yeah. find the right chord for that moment? Or is it the musical supervisor or the musical director or the orchestrator or the arranger yeah. in all these? Well, it's the old question, you know, how much is Sondheim Sondheim and how much is Sondheim Tunic? Yeah. And can you be Sondheim without Tunic? Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I think mm. the issue, the music was very pretty to listen to. Way too many ballads, as always, when oh, it yes. comes to pop song writers. And way too many... I'm sad, so I'm going to sing about how sad I am and not move the story. And I remember sitting there, we just had a ballad, and then a moment in the dialogue was happening. I thought, please, not another ballad. Oh, another they're, doing, ballad. they're doing a ballad. Okay. This is the other danger with pop songs. There aren't there aren't many speech marks of any genre of pop songs. No. Um, because even in the old days, when comedy pop songs were a thing, which is much more than 1960s, you know, Right Said Fred by the late Bernard Cribbins, or sung by the late Bernard Cribbins, anyway, it was by um, uh, Dixon Rudge, I think. But anyway... Um, not, to, were, not, uh, not to be confused with I'm Too Sexy, sung by Right Said Fred. No, not to be confused about that at all, although obviously riffing on the title. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, in the 1960s, certainly in the British pops, there were lots and lots of comic songs, but they were already being identified as being novelty numbers. Mm. They were novelty songs, not proper pop. Um, that is, You don't now get those novelty songs nearly so much. Occasionally a Bob the Builder gets through or Mr Blobby or something like that. We haven't had those for 20 years. No. Um, you know, the, 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 the 
the charts, pop music has become a lot more narrower than even it was in the 60s. If you, list, if you just look at a top 20 listing of any week, certainly the British charts in the 1960s, for example, you will see an enormous range of things in that chart. You will not find that range now. And that is the danger of bringing pop into musicals. There's no reason why pop shouldn't be used in musicals, but you have to use the pop idiom, the things that make pop popular, ironically, <laughs> into the whole sphere that a well-written musical will require. So I'm, I'm afraid, I also agree with you. I haven't seen the show, so I don't judge this show particularly, but I am worried about the implicit limitations of pop songs and particularly pop lyrics in a well-written musical because are they up to the task? And I go back to this point. What if you're just writing lyrics which are prose set to music rather than doing anything with it? And if you're not putting rhymes in, the craft isn't there. And if the craft mm. isn't there for the rhymes, the craft isn't there for the ideas. I keep repeating myself, but um, that's because I'm right. Yes, I agree. I think you're right as well. Right said thoughts. <laughs> it's a shame because also musically, it's very piano, guitar, strings. So it's immediately a kind of very non-specific, I don't want to say dirge, because the, the music was quite lovely. And there's a couple folky? of... At, at times, but I Country? think... No, yeah. it, there was a couple of soul-ish moments, which is Joss Stone's influence. And I must say, the other composer and lyricist was Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics. Oh, famous, yes. Uh, who did Ghost, the musical with Glenn Ballard, who yeah. also did Back to the Future, the musical. So there's all these kind of... There's a triangulation yes. to be made, yes. And the saddest thing for me when it came to the music was you have all these different eras of time, and yet the music wasn't expressing that. Well, there you are. And that's an easy win as well. Mm. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be slavishly 18th century and a minuet, but actually you do want perhaps a harpsichord feel. Yeah, well, or... we never get, went, go no, back that... Uh, I'm picking something into, that's got a very particular yeah. sound in the in, in public consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing we did have was a kind of 80s-ish bit, which is obviously Dave Stewart saying, well, yeah. we can... I can do this. <laughs> do, do, I can do this beat. But it's just a bit bit of a disappointment because the idea was great, the story is great, the cast were phenomenal. And that was my third question. Yeah. What about the performances? Performances were wonderful, nothing against them. The illusions were really good when it came to how is he going to yeah. disappear from... It was, it was like Ghosts... And I, I love Ghost for the direction and the staging and the cast, not so much the writing of the songs. So that's where the problem started, I think. So these, these are really good narrative ideas, mm. where unfortunately the scores are not quite finessed. They're held up to, by the direction, whereas a musical should really be held up by held the Held up here songs. and supported, you mean? Yeah. Yes, yes, quite. That's really interesting, yeah. So maybe this is one or two drafts in terms of the lyrics off real success speaking of time travel <laughs> have we done so we in have one direction <laughs> we are going to stop this episode and i'm sure your tube journey is nearly over dear listener so do join us next week where we shall resume this conversation thank you for us a great pleasure thank you very much indeed and uh, we'll speak to you soon thank you for listening to this week's episode of musical talk to find out more about the world of musical talk you can visit our website at musicaltalk.co.uk where you'll find all our episodes, or you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Musical Talk. <laughs>